Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 28 of the Movement is Medicine podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Carr, and I am joined today by my very special guest, Scott Livingston. Scott, uh, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Kevin. It's a pleasure. Uh, for those of you that don't know Scott or haven't listened to his uh, amazing Leave Your Mark podcast, um, Scott is athletic trainer, strength and conditioning specialist based out of Canada. And fellow Canadian, you know, I have a thing for Canadians, just like uh, my wife, <laughs> um, Montrealers, I guess, specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, and Scott has a really kind of interesting background, both in professional sports, athletic training, strength conditioning, and now um, education, as well as a private privatized fitness. And so um, I really wanted to get Scott on here to kind of tell his story um, about his history in strength conditioning and how it's kind of led him to where he is today. And it's, Scott is also one of our amazing guest speakers at the MBSC Spring Seminar that's taking place April 1st and 2nd at Mike Will Strength and Conditioning, and figured it'd be a good time for him to kind of talk about his topics. So, Scott, um, for those of the people who, you know, don't know you, um, you know, where did the Scott Livingston story begin? You know, how did you get into strength and conditioning and like what was what was it in kind of your childhood that led you into the field of performance and athletic training? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I um, I was a football player as a kid, uh, played hockey as well, but more football than hockey. And uh, as such, started to learn, you know, strength training fairly early on. Even back in those days, it was a, a piece of, uh, of the football uh, paradigm for preparation. So got into that kind of on the side. And then, as I had mentioned to you before we came on, I actually was at one point interested in going into uh, radio and television arts, and I wanted to be a, a, a radio talk show DJ or DJ. And my father basically said to me, uh, I'm not helping you go to school with that. You need to get a university degree. So I was like, okay, well, the next best thing was uh, probably a physical education degree. And I was thinking about playing football. And then I was introduced to a program up in, at Concordia University in Montreal, where your gal is from. And uh, it was an exercise science program that had a specialization in athletic therapy. So uh, I didn't really know what athletic therapy was up until that point. And, you know, all I knew an athletic trainer or therapist was, was the guy to tape my ankles kind of thing. <laughs> and so I uh, went up and started the program. And so as I was doing the program, I was discovering, you know, what it was and what I could be with it. Same time, I was still lifting weights and I'd given up on my football career career. And uh, so I was kind of doing those things in dual. And then when I finished my university degree, I I worked in a private clinic for a while as an AT, got certified as an AT and uh, kept strength training. And one day I discovered the National Strength Conditioning Association journal at a YMCA that I was going to. And I was like, oh, what's what's this? This is in the late 80s. And, you know, it wasn't uh, a very known thing in Canada. And so um, I kind of looked into the certification, really didn't know that you could become a, and I mean, for your listeners, Canada at the time probably is about 10 years behind the United States in terms of that industry and those professionals. And so it was just becoming something that people knew about in Canada. And so I was probably one of the early first adopters of the strength conditioning certification. I went down and did my NSCA exam in 1990 and, uh, in, uh, what was it near, near Yale university, uh, which is a, an interesting commentary on, on a, the state of an interesting city. Like <laughs> the, the, the exactly. city is a, looked like a bomb hit it, but the, the, the university is beautiful, yeah. but beautiful. That's, yeah. that's on the story. outskirts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I got certified as an, a, a strength coach, and then I got an opportunity to work as both an AT strength coach at the university. And I was, to my knowledge, I was the first strength conditioning coach, full time strength conditioning coach at a Canadian university in the nineties. Uh, and then organizations started to hire people. <clears throat> you started to see in the NHL that guys were being hired in hockey and strength conditioning, and. Um, guys like Pete Twist and Lauren Goldenberg and those guys were starting to work in hockey. And I got to know that fraternity and I uh, was going down to the NSCA conferences. And, um, you know, that's when I first actually ran into Mike, um, you know, speaking and things like that and what he was doing and ran into um, Gray Cook back in the early 90s when him and uh, Lee Burton were starting the FMS and stuff. And I had a sort of a, a very similar thought uh, thought paradigm as gray did and lee did about you know this this understanding movement and looking at movement and 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 recognizing how we could you know change the way the quality of the way somebody moved and so i was bringing those two hats together a lot in my practice 
And nearing the ends of the 90s, uh, I was kind of looking for something different to do. And that's when I had an opportunity to go down and work for the New York Islanders as strength coach AT. Uh, that's when I first started to get to know Mike. I ran my first hockey summit in 1998 in uh, Montreal and brought a huge group of people uh, at the time to him. Mike came up and spoke and other um, relatively well-known strength coaches in hockey spoke at that one. And we did another one in 99. I put it to bed and then kept working in the NHL, got a job uh, with the Rangers uh, one year after my Islanders job, left the Islanders, then was with the Rangers, lost that job at the end of my contract and came back and worked for the Montreal Canadiens for eight years back home. And when I got back home, I started uh, a business, a brick and mortar gym with some other people, a performance facility and um, started working with Olympic athletes. And at that point I was really bringing what I called the two animals together in a model that I've called reconditioning. Some people call it performance therapy. Um, it, it, it's kind of this genre of, of, you know, using the skills that you learn a therapeutic practice and you, and you learn in a strength conditioning practice to sort of uh, energize each other rather than fight against each other, which I've mm -hmm. always noticed was one of the problems in our industry is those two narratives fight against each other. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of started to make my mission changing that. Um, and the work that I started to do more and more of uh, became kind of return to play centric, reconditioning centric, taking people who are broken and rebuilding them uh, while also performance training people. I was doing a lot of work with Olympic athletes. That was through, say, 06 to to now. And uh, I, I got blessed to work with a foundation in Canada called B210 that supported Olympic athletes. And so I kind of got to run these very boutique centric performance groups around Canadian Olympic athletes and worked with almost every kind of athlete that you could consider. The funny thing about it, I was talking to somebody else the other day about this is I I one time was known as the uh, football strength coach. Then I became the <laughs> hockey strength coach and therapist. Then I became the Olympic strength coach. Yeah. Then I became the return to play guy. So I'm, you know, where, wherever you've met me in my life, I have some acumen, but I'm kind of the everything guy. I, I, I look at them all. So that's the kind evolution, of my, my the career. evolution yeah, of Scott exactly. Livingston. There's so much yeah. good stuff in there. I want to circle back to, I just thought at the very beginning, I just thought, you know, the irony that you always wanted to become a DJ and now you have a podcast with over 300 episodes, you were going to get your way back in front of that microphone <laughs> one way or another. So uh, that's good to hear. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but I, so I'm, many I'm parallels. Yeah. So many parallels be between you and what I've heard about Mike's background. A lot of people, guys probably at the beginning, like strength and conditioning wasn't a, you know, a normal job. It wasn't a very popular thing in the eighties into the nineties and, Mm -hmm. A lot of guys like yourself and, you know, started as athletic trainers and then kind of backed their way into becoming strength and conditioning coaches as that became a career. Right. And like, so strength training might've been a passion, mm -hmm. um, but wasn't a job yet. And then I think that really actually positioned people like you to actually have a really unique impact on the field because you had a perspective on injury and rehab and then were took your passion for performance and eventually became a career to be able to make an impact. So have you found that that has really helped your vision? Obviously now with the reconditioning, uh, your, your business, your brand is really based around that. Um, mm -hmm. how has that really helped you kind of build your philosophy and your approach? Well, I think, you know, when you look at the, the historical development of the strength conditioning industry, it was developed on the backs of the strength sports. So you, you know, bodybuilding, Olympic lifting and powerlifting were kind of the animals that, and, and str strong man were the, the, the four animals that sort of created the strength conditioning industry for, for whatever it, it became. And that tended to be the, the narrative driver of, of how we trained athletes. And what I started to recognize early on in my career was that that there's a difference between your focal lens being how much you can lift because you can win a competition or you can be the biggest guy in the room and how much you needed to lift in order to be athletic and to perform at your best. And I started to recognize that that was on a continuum and a spectrum dependent upon how much performance actually meant the ultimate performance of point A to point B meant to your sporting acumen. So when you look at most sports, I mean, unless you get into the fabric of some uh, very unique Olympic sports, 
sports. Uh, most of them are not based on a point A to point B or how far you can throw th- something or how, how, how big you are. There are sports like that. Mm-hmm. But most of them, especially when you look at the North Amer- American genre of sport, it's about playing a sport, playing a game, and then how performance supports that. Um, and in each sport, it's um, unique to the sport. Um you know, football is a, you could make an argument is a, is probably 80% performance centric and 20% skill centric or mm-hmm. some variation therein. And it's also position dependent. Uh, whereas, you know, when I get into hockey, hockey is kind of the reverse of that. It's probably 80% skill centric and 20, 30% performance centric. Yeah. Um, you know, if you can't skate and you can't move a puck and you can't shoot, um, it doesn't matter how strong you are. And that that became actually in the early days of of guys like myself and stuff being in the industry. And Mike would probably tell the same stories is, you know, guys would say, you know, what does it matter how strong I am? You know, I'm putting the puck in the net. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm scoring, you know, so you had to kind of bring a justification of value prop there, whereas football guys have always known that. A little being a little bit stronger, having a bigger, bigger vertical jump, et cetera, was important. And, and, and it made a difference on your ability to play on the field of play. And I think football became sort of the driving animal in North mm-hmm. America for how people trained athletes. Um, and I think that that unfortunately was a bit of a, you know, there were obviously huge value props in hybridizing some of the stuff that football players did into other sports. The problem was it, it became sort of the blanket proposition of how you yep. train these athletes. And what it did is it, it, it didn't recognize the differences. You know, a simple example in hockey was that hockey is a very multi-directional sport, um, stop and a dime, change directions, all kinds of different directions. You have a lot of rotational patterns. You're on a, a, at the edge of a, of a, a skating blade. You're, you're manifesting load with a stick that's an extension of you, all these different things. So when strength training started to come into hockey through the early 90s, what you saw was this rash of abdominal tears and groin yep. tears because there was this huge rotational demand that nobody was really caring about. It was all, you're in the rack and you're squatting and you're benching and you're pull, pulling cleans and everything else. And so then it was just kind of like, holy geez, we need to relook at this. So the long answer to your short question is <laughs> it, 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 it really, you know, me being a therapist made me look at movement differently, made me kind of inquire and be interested in what was the difference between one animal and the other animal and, and what they needed to do with their body and which really lends itself to what I'm going to speak about at your conference, which is this really understanding the human movement that, that the person in front of you is doing. So you're actually preparing them to do it well. Yeah. And what you, I mean, outlined really clearly is understanding the demands of the sport. Like when you just described the demands of a hockey player, uh, highly rotational frontal plane movements um, and it's very skill centric, um, the, I think the problem, like you said, even still today is we're so strongly influenced by traditional strength sports um, mm. that you have many people who get into the strength conditioning injury, uh, industry because they have a passion for lifting weights. But that doesn't necessarily always translate for a passion for developing athletes mm. and being able to differentiate the two of those is something we talk a lot with our interns and our younger coaches um, who are always real gung ho about lifting. Um, and then you go and you work with a hockey player who has a completely different set of demands. And like you said, it's easy to sell lifting weights to uh, the football guys. They, you don't ever have to tell them, you know, add weight. You never have to ask them to be able to lift, but you know, hockey, they kind of naturally understand, like you said, I'm putting the puck in the net. Mm -hmm. Um, What does it matter? And so being able to communicate that to also speak their sport, like you just did. So they understand that you understand the demands of their sport so important. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's really Mm kind of how you build trust with a lot of these people as well. And so, you know, in, in doing that, you worked your way into professional hockey for a, a really long period of time. How, how did you get into uh, professional hockey in the first place? And then were your perspectives on what that job would be like different kind of than, than your early expectations? Because one thing I hear a lot of young coaches talk about when they come through like our internship program is, you know, I want to work in professional sports. And then once they get there, it's not necessarily this disappointment, but it's different probably than what they uh, expect it to be. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, It's, it's a hard job. It's a demanding job. And there's a lot of uh, complex things you have to deal with. So for you, how was, what was that experience like for you kind of transitioning into, Mm -hmm. you know, professional sports? Yeah. I mean, I, um, I saw it as this opportunity to, 
uh, first a sport that I kind of knew and loved and had a, a um, an interest in. Um, two it was the pinnacle you know, from a Canadian boy perspective yeah. was the, the pinnacle sport to get involved in. Um, and, you know, as, as it is in human nature, we kind of look at people who are in the higher levels of these kinds of things as the people who must know what they're talking about. So I knew that by, by working in professional hockey, that would give me some street cred and the things that I wanted to do in the future. So, uh, uh, you know, I, as I was kind of coming to the end of my term working at the university where I probably would have stayed had it had the budget to build facilities and do things, I was getting a little bit sort of despondent about where that was going. So it was kind of like, what, what's the next horizon? And ironically, um, I was trying to get a job with the Montreal Canadiens through some of the contacts I had there. And they weren't really, the Canadian teams are a little slower to hire up on, on, on that position. And, uh, but I had made my interest known to the head therapist of the Mo Montreal Canadiens at the time, a guy named Gaetan Lefebvre. And Gates was down at the draft and he ran into a guy named Mike Santos, who was the assistant GM with the New York Islanders. And so I came back from, ironically, from the NSCA conference uh, once in in 1998, and I received a phone message on my message machine back in the day. No one and knows. I pushed, None of the kids listening yeah, exactly. know what that and is. And I pushed play on it, and uh, out came this voice of this guy, Richie Campbell, who was the head therapist of the team at the time. And Richie said, "We, you know, we heard you're interested in a job. We'd like to interview you. So I went down in New York, and I interviewed, and um Interviewed with the with the new the new GM, the head physician, who's a guy named Elliot Pellman, who, if you ever watched the movie Concussion, is the chief was the chief internist physician for the NFL and uh, was our our chief internist with the team, and he gets himself into a little bit of hot water in that movie. But yeah. anyways, <laughs> I digress. <laughs> so I interviewed with Elliot, and Elliot looked at me, and this was a Friday, and he said to me, you know, we'd like to hire you. Um, when can you be here? And I said, well, maybe in about two weeks. And he said, we need you here on Monday. And I was, <laughs> I was like, okay, I'll go. So I turned my life around, went down there. And to the point of your question, like um, my – my thought was, hey, I'm going to be in the big time. This is going to be the NHL. I'm going to bring all my knowledge and yada, yada, yada. And then I was with one of the teams that was probably not a best representation of the team, the league at the time. Um, not, not great budget, kind of in turmoil. And it was a bit of a circus. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I you know, I started to realize that what I what I could do and what I would be able to implicate in myself there was not what I thought I would be able to do. And that's why I left and went to the Rangers. But even with the Rangers, there was a limited amount of what I could do and where I could go and came back to Canada and again, was able to do some interesting things because of the relationships I had with the staff and, and work my sort of my process. But to those people who sometimes become despondent with it is you have to recognize when you go into pro sport, um, as a strength conditioning coach, most of the time you don't get to train your athletes because they have a contract that lasts the season. And unless they live in your city, which most of them don't, most of them go to warm places and live in the <laughs> yeah. summertime, either their cottage in Northern Ontario or they go to LA or whatever, or wherever it is. So you're not necessarily really getting the chance to make a difference with the athletes you're working with. And in the season, Hockey takes precedence over training. So your job really, and that's why it was valuable to be a therapist, is your job is to make sure they don't get injured and to take care of the guys who aren't playing that much and to, you know, stay on top of people's fitness as, as best you can in support of what they're doing. And so I started to realize as I went along in my career that about 30% of my work was stuff I really liked doing and about 70% wasn't. Yeah. And so that's why I left the NHL. And the last thing you have to really understand is you need to really want to be a part of a team. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you, you, you have to sort of take away the, your, your insular or internal goals in favor of what the organizational goals are. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think as a, as a learned professional, you're, you, you want to sort of shine, you want to do good work, you want to deliver your best. And at the same time, it tends to be mitigated or managed down to the lowest common denominator of the schedule, the timing. So you're never really delivering your best capacity in the business. And so it starts to become a little bit frustrating. So unless you're really into being part of a team and the connection to that and your contribution to it, 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 it becomes hard for people over time. Yeah. It's such a 
complex environment where it's the therapist, the doctors, the head coaches, the GM, the strength coach, it's all of those pieces. So, you know, you get a lot of these coaches or people who come in and think, oh, I'm going to change the world in this job. And then you realize that, hey, you got to mm -hmm. find your place in this. And that kind of takes you to, you know, the, what you touched on earlier that, you know, so often you see the rehab and training components like fighting against each other. Like you touched about the idea of reconditioning them working together mm -hmm. um, in an ideal environment, which sometimes can happen in a team environment. Some uh, oftentimes it also doesn't happen in a team environment. Ideally, these things should work together. It's about developing a relationship between the medical staff and the performance staff together to try to get people where they need to go. Because uh, those are the biggest challenges that we tend to face in putting the athlete first and figuring out the best path to get them to where it is they need to go. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. I had a conversation with Andy O'Brien, who you've probably heard of, yep. and uh, we were chatting about the, it's kind of like an, a learned narrative. The performance coach wants uh, to create uh, success and um, call it robustness through overreaching. And the therapist wants to create performance and uh, robustness through protection. So they have a different narrative internally. Um, and so that narrative, if not really um, honored between the two parties and recognized, and in essence, trying to find a common language where you can kind of work together on something, what it ends up being is uh, becomes a place for miscommunication. So, you know, I'm trying to get this guy in shape and you're getting in my way yeah. and I'm trying to protect this guy and you're doing things that are going to hurt this guy, you know, so mm -hmm. unless you've come to a place where you both understand what you're trying to do and honor that, which requires a, a common language of practice, uh, a, a, an honest empathy for one another and a, and a sense of what each other does and a true understanding of what each other does. Um, y y it's hard to speak that language. It's like you, your, your lovely wife is from Montreal. It's like, yeah. if you don't speak a little bit of French, yeah. you don't know what, and you don't understand the French culture, you're not going to get along with French Canadians and vice yeah. versa. <laughs> but it, once you start to understand it a little bit and you recognize it's a little different culture, they come from different things and you start to embrace it, all of a sudden you're having fun. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the difference, right? And that's a human issue too. It's why we we're always running into, you know, the issues we have sociologically is just simply, do we understand the person across from us? Are we taking time to, to have some social empathy in some mm -hmm. sense? And then, so you, you took your kind of adventure then into a privatized uh, model, right? Like starting a business and, and a brand and kind of how has that changed your practice? Are you still seeing many hockey players? Are you working, like you said, you got into the Olympic Olympic guy. Um, what what was kind of that transition like for you and, and what type of athletes are you seeing most regularly now? Yeah, I, um, I went from ho a hockey sort of centric situation to working with all kinds of different Olympic athletes. I first started um, with some athletes who were in mogul skiing, then did some bobsled athletes, judo, diving, wrestling, um, you know, you name it, I've worked with it at some point. So mm -hmm. what that has gifted me over time is just a recognition of, of the whole portfolio of different the athlete spectrum and sort of what is unique to one sport or different about one sport. And again, going back to what I'll be talking a little bit about in the, the presentation is I think too often our template for human movement dynamics is built off of the big four or the big mm -hmm. three in, in the United States. And, and I would say even more to the big two basketball and, and, and football. Mm -hmm. So we kind of react to or look at the way people move around that sort of spectrum. And what looking at divers, uh, wrestlers, combatives, um, you know, uh, you know, whether it's variations in skiers, I start mm -hmm. to react, recognize that there's a lot of real differences and, and oh, some yeah. similarities, you know, and, and a simple example in skiing, you know, mogul skiing, uh, a lot of my brethren in strength and conditioning will start working a lot of impulse centric work, a lot of, you know, pop dynamics. And in mogul skiing, it's the exact opposite. It's all, all about ground acquisition. Mm -hmm. It's all about how you land and how you accept load, et cetera. And so, you have to prepare your athlete to actually decelerate and control and manage terrain versus how you get off the ground, which is what everybody else is working on in basketball and football and et cetera. So you have to change the paradigm of how you do your plyometrics, how you do your training, what your training protocols are, all based on what that athlete does. So 
it's given me a unique vision of, you know, things I could pull into one sport or pull out of another and pull in from one athlete and pull into another. And I was blessed to be able to do it because there was a foundation that some friends of mine started that was uh, funded by wealthy Canadians to support Olympic athletes. So we got to do some really unique projects around these athletes where we didn't really have budgets, mm -hmm. you know, so I could work with them five, six days a week for you know, two hours if I wanted to. And, and there wasn't something, you know, some business model that was constraining me around that. So that allowed me to really play in the sand of that a lot and, uh, and helped me see what I could and couldn't do and stuff. So it's been a really cool experience for me. Yeah, the beauty of, you know, sometimes being in a private setting where you have a lot of control um, and freedom to do that is that you feel like you said you could maximize your impact. The, the strength of like being able to have an athlete in there, like you said, five, six days a week to have varying inputs and to be able to continue to really build a relationship and be on the pulse of what they are dealing with on a daily basis mm -hmm. is so valuable. And that's the one thing that I've really valued at being an MBSC is like the kind of time I'm able to spend with people in the long term development over someone's career, the ups and the downs mm. and the changes is something that that's really unique to kind of the setting that I know you or I uh, are both working in. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, something that you've really touched on that was interesting was, you know, the gained perspectives of being across a bunch of different sports, being able to, like you said, skiing, judo, um, bobsledding, all very different, um, especially mm -hmm. like you said, from the four major sports in the United States that people talk about. And I mean, I know you touched on the mogul skiing idea, but were there any other big kind of aha moments in your career where like that, those experiences kind of open up your eyes to different things or a different way to doing things? Uh, for yourself. Yeah. Lots of them. Like um, bobsleigh, you mentioned bobsleigh going back. Like the interesting thing, most most bobsledders come, a lot of them come from a track or football background. So you've got these guys that are, you know, 240, 250 pounds. They're big, big men, very explosive, very fast. But the irony is that they, they get to explode for about five seconds and then they have to crawl yeah. into and make themselves really small and get into this like <laughs> flying rocket. Right. Yeah. So, and then, and then they have to sit there and manage the G forces of that and then get out and do it again. And so all of their training goes into preparing themselves to jump in, but then you start looking at, they start getting, you know, different kinds of injuries and you start to ask yourself the question, well, is it, are they not preparing their body to jump into this machine and make themselves small? So if all your preparation is about being faster, stronger, explosive, and not about mobility and bring yourself into a cocoon space and being quick at being able to do that, you're not going to perform very well. So you have to start looking at you, you have to start looking at the sport and going, what are all the component parts of it? Yes, there's a bigger, faster, stronger piece to it, uh, like there was when they were playing football. But now there's a different piece of it where they have to be they have to make themselves small, compact, tight, manage G force in those postures and positions. So how do we prepare them for that? Also, Things that are never re reflected on, like they're loading and unloading their sleds all the time because they don't have this, you know, they're not like the NFL or the NHL where they have a bunch of equipment managers who push everything around. The budgets aren't there. So these guys, they're athletes, Olympic athletes, but then they're grabbing their sled and moving it and yeah. lifting it. And, tr you know, so so how are they preparing for that as well? Because it's an odd load, side, side load, all this kind of stuff. So you have to start thinking about what are all the dynamics around it. Like, interesting story I was working with aerial skier skiers one time and they're just they just do these jumps and spins and all this kind of stuff and the coach i built this off-season program was all about impulse and you know power and all these different things and rotary stuff and the guy says do you have you got them doing any uh, cardio and i'm like what do you wh why would they do cardio and he goes well because when we go to the the diving ramp or the the jump ramp in the summertime they have to climb 150 stairs every time they want to do a rep and if they oh do 15 God. 20 reps yeah they're going to be exhausted if they don't have an aerobic base. I'm like, wow, okay. You know, so <laughs> it gives you perspective on what goes into these things. So like even divers, like 10 meter divers, people don't, mm -hmm. they, they don't have an elevator that takes them up there. Yeah. 
they could climb, they have to climb up. up the stairs and do the dive, you know? Yeah. So yeah, it's all in the water, but there's this after thing where they've got to climb, you know, four stories, four stories, four stories, four stories. So they better be fit. <laughs> yeah. Such a like really digging into some of these other sports. You don't realize the demands that might take place when you're not watching them on camera, exactly. you're not watching exactly. their performance actually really weigh on them. It's so interesting. And that's why yeah. I think it's so valuable to, you know, get experiences in a bunch of different settings to learn because then your mindset as a coach, you become a really widespread. I would say like the, be a great generalist to be able to specify into these other things and that perspective. So, so mm -hmm. helpful. Um, and so your topic for the seminar is using video analysis to inform your programming. And I think it's really valuable. I mean, obviously everyone has a video access at their hand at all times, but I think sometimes coaches, they take videos and they might not understand what to look at or how to use that to mm -hmm. inform their programming. They just know sometimes something looks good, something doesn't look good. Um, how practically, if, you, if you're working with an athlete, how do you connect the dots between you know, what it is that you see from video analysis, whether it's of their performance or of its of their training, how do you connect that to make changes in your programming? And how does it inform you um, right. in a way that really is practical? Well, I, I usually go through a process and obviously um, to some degree it comes, it comes a little bit easier for me at this stage in my career because of seeing so many different athletes. But um, when I see, when I stick on a new sport, I always want to get curious about what really is the sport all about. What are all the different permutations and, and derivations of movement that the person does? So I'll watch the sport and then I'll slow it down. And the great thing about YouTube and all these different things now is, you know, if somebody says, well, I play table tennis, I can go on YouTube table tennis to the cats come home and watch and watch, you know, what the athletes do around that table and how they have to move. And so I'm, what I'm trying to figure out is, what are the different movement patterns they have to do? What are some of the um, constraints or non-negotiables that are in their movement? Like if you take a table tennis player, well, they have to move around a table. They have to hold yeah. a, a paddle. They, you know, they're playing against somebody in front of them. So their visual field is always down. So I'm getting to know what it is they, what are the movement constraints? What are the movement requirements? What are the postures they have to get into? So I, I sort of do my due diligence on that. Then I'll sit down with the athlete and a coach and I'll say, you know, what does good movement look like? What does poor movement look like in your opinion? So, you know, there's always a, a little bit of a bandwidth there of, of, of what a, a, a good, you know, bat hit looks like or a good pitch looks like and some derivations off of that. But there's usually a, a sort of a sense of this is what it should look like, plus or minus. So I get a sense of what the ideal is and uh, through that kind of due diligence. And then I and then I look at what's real. I, I look at the person, both how they move functionally and dynamically, and then I'll look at video of them doing the same actions, so playing the table tennis. So now what I want to see is how do they actually negotiate moving around the table? What does their body do? And what I'm starting to try to recognize is in my assessment process, I'm then going to try to figure out where are the areas of the move of movement that I have to kind of key in on and understand from an attribute perspective, whether it's their hip needs to be able to do this. They need to be able to move their trunk without moving their pelvis. They need to be able to, you know, get a great big, like a simple example would be if you look at a field goal kicker, you know, when a field goal kicker lands on their foot to kick the ball, mm -hmm. they've got a huge amount of, you know, um, plantar flexion with eversion, mm -hmm. huge shin angle, um, big uh, adduction of the of the plant side leg, while the other legs flying through and producing all this power. Mm -hmm. um, and then their body is on top of that in a leaned position. And then they're rotating through that. So you get all this rotation, you get a plant dynamic on one side, and it's not dissimilar to a kick in soccer. So now I start to recognize, well, that ank that plant side ankle needs to have this much range. That hip needs to have this much range in this position. This has to be able to rotate on that. Da, 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 da. So now I, I know what is re what is ideal, what is real. And then I can sort of take it apart and see if it's there. And I'll, ultimately I can create a target for what I want to create for that person. So I want to make sure that the, what is desired, what we're building towards is actually the movement qualities that they need to be able to exhibit in their sport. So, or their activity. And so I'm doing a due diligence survey. I'm kind of an, an analyzing all that to understand. So the video informs me as to whether their body meets the ideal and how mm -hmm. far away it is and where it's far away. So I can fix those things. That's great. And I mean, it really, 
you know, shines a light on, you know, understanding the details of especially some of these more unique things, like you mentioned, like a field goal kicker. Like some, a lot of people might think, yeah, you know, you just train him and then let him go kick. But there's a lot of unique demands for them to be able to do that repeatedly over a season, over a career to perform well, but also, you know, avoid injuries um, yeah. and being able to look at the sport and connect those dots. And I know, uh, you know, people like Greg Rose have done a really good job with baseball and with golf, with things like TPI and on base U. I know I've, I've learned a lot from watching them. And, um, you know, that that is something that should be kind of looked at across all sports, like you mentioned. And so having coaches being able to be comfortable being able to look and analyze and learn a sport, like you said, table tennis, very unique demands back and forth. Some people might think, oh, that's just, you know, it's like ping pong. But if you ever watch these people play, it's it's, it's really unbelievable uh, what mm-hmm. it is that they do. I know Dan McGinley, who's a strength and conditioning coach at MBSC, um, he spent 18 months over in China for us working specifically with table Olympic table tennis players. And he mm-hmm. came back saying, like, I learned so much watching them play like he said he would just watch hours of them playing back and forth um and how that really affected his programming he never would have thought going into it that it would have been so much different and so uh being able to develop the coach's eye and the curiosity i think is the big thing that you said at the very beginning to want to learn more i think is so important um because as kind of circling back to what we said at the beginning it the the traditional strength training approach probably doesn't apply nearly as much as you think as you start to get into the margins, especially in sports that are outside of, you know, uh, football, especially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's um, I think when you kind of see the online um, arguments around <laughs> call it uh, specific training versus generalized training and people are advocates for one or the other or or anti something i think it's just again getting back to that sort of misunderstanding what 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 people are talking about mm-hmm. and i think when you talk about the specificity of training i think it gets thrown into this bucket of you know bouncing off bosus and standing on swiss balls yeah. and squatting and things like that and that's not specificity what specificity is 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 actually looking at what the demand uh, realities of your athlete are and sort of recognizing that in the gym is the gym is a laboratory for experimentation to see whether you can provide overload and stimulus to systems um, and to make them prepared to deal with what it is they have to deal with in real life. Uh, in real life, there's a lot of chaos, but if you can give them a, a quality foundation to to manage that chaos, the, the, the better you're going to be, you know, and there's a lot of things that People just don't look at like I work in, in looking at alpine skiers as an example. You know, alpine skiers have to sit down in a very low tuck position, extend forward, and have a horizontal visual field. So now they're in an extended position. So if they don't have cervical extension, how's that going to affect their posture? Mm-hmm. You know, they're in order for them to see the ski hill, they're going to have to rise. Well, if they rise, then now the wind is hitting them. So now they're slower. So it's going to ch- check their performance or they're going to have to raise their hips maybe a little bit more, which is going to change the dynamics in their spine and their hips and load and da da da. So then they start to get back problems or they start to get this problem. And it's all coming from the fact that they have no C spine extension. Yep. So, you know, and the same thing, you have a defensive back. If a defensive back has to look, even, a, you know, a transcends back in a football, if a defensive back has to look look at the player in front of him and rotate his shoulders underneath. Well, that's actually um, a reflex system in our system between our vision and our reflexive posture to allow ourselves to be able to spin while still being visually fixed. So we need to know whether that actually works or it's not working because otherwise you're going to have compensations in either the way you, you load, change directions, focus, miss the ball, da, 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 da. So there's so much to learn and understand about sport and just kind of going, well, I'm here to make them bigger, faster, stronger. To me, that's an offload to, to, you know, it, it, that's easier for me. I, I, I just have to teach squats and cleans and bench and I'm good. Well, good. Train people who need to squat, clean, and bench. <laughs> if you want to train athletes, you need to know all the things that they're doing. And that doesn't mean you have to make it overly complex. You just have to recognize that you can make a difference to how your athletes move, not just make them bigger, faster, stronger in a cylinder, you know? Yeah, it takes me. I remember Mike telling us a story about uh, an NBA player that we had at the gym that, you know, he, he came to us essentially with like hip flexor hernia symptoms, right? Um, and he, we talked about like, Oh, when do you feel it? And he's like, you know, whenever I'm in the post and I go to rotate, it, it really pulls and hurts. And that's where the initial injury was. 
Um, and then kind of going through a whole assessment with him, we get down to the feet and he's like, oh yeah, I have this big toe that, you know, doesn't extend. So I try to just work around it when I rotate. And then you realize like he couldn't open his hips because he, he had to overly open his hips essentially because he couldn't push off through his foot. He couldn't toe off through his foot. And Huge. the second you get their feet moving or get their ankles moving all of a sudden, like, oh my God, I, that, that's not putting all that strain on the front side of my hip. Um, and, and so you realize all these pieces are connected and it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, we talk about working with golfers. Um, this is the time where, you know, we see a lot of, uh, golfers in the gym because it's their off season, right? They're trying to develop mm -hmm. themselves as physically as best they can. And then realizing like they can't take the swing plane that they want at the ball because their hip th doesn't rotate or their T-spine doesn't rotate. And you could take all the golf lessons in the world. Um, it, but if you can't get in the position to, to make the impact you want on the ball, it doesn't matter very much. And so being mm -hmm. able to kind of have that detective like thinking and be able to work through and connect the pieces back to how they move is, is really key, especially in these sports that are going to demand lots of multi-planar movement, uh, mm -hmm. to get the job done. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, the guys you mentioned, Greg Rose, like the guys at TPI have effectively done that with golf. They mm -hmm. looked at, they, you know, they brought together the pros, you know, what is a, what's a slice look like? What's a hook look like? What is, what are the mechanics that create a slice? What are the mechanics that create a, a hook? Well, now we know what the mechanics are, you know, can we look at the, the physical mechanicals and kind of de describe where those things aren't moving? So then we know it's not moving. Can we change it? Can we, can we modify it? Can we improve it? And I think then when you start to layer on sort of the, um, neurology that I want to introduce to people a little bit through this process and some of the, the reflex of propositions, the visual vestibular elements, all these things start to come together and becomes very interesting, like how we move, you know, how our body moves. Like I had a, uh, I'm going to show a video of it in the, in the, in the presentation, I got a couple of my guys to do a, a reverse POV point of view video with a GoPro on their heads. So you could see their body when they were skating and wow. what, what became very interesting to me is that everything your body does is to keep your head still and your horizontal visual field. Mm -hmm. Everything's moving around underneath. It's like a conic, a, a cone underneath a, a, a fixed point. So that's all moving around this. It's not the other way around. Like you're not moving your head to get two places. You're moving your body to keep your head in the same place. Mm -hmm. As soon as you see movement from that perspective, you recognize it's wow, it's a wholly different animal than what I thought it was. And then when you start to think about ground contact and recognize that certain ground contact is required in order for you to, to be able to push off or to create a skate edge or have a ski on where it needs to be, well, now those two things become massive constraints on how your move body moves between point A and point B, right? Mm -hmm. And so now the rest of your body has to assemble itself so your head stays fixed at a horizontal plane and your foot ground contacts where it needs to be. That means you got to have a whole lot of mojo in between, yes. right? <laughs> and it's not just about, you know, how strong you are, right? Yeah, so. that's a really amazing kind of perspective. And, and and I think the presentation will really open up a lot of the coaches' eyes who both work in a you know, private setting and general population because those people are all doing things every day too. Um, sometimes mm -hmm. I think we think like, oh, these things are only for athletes, but these people play recreational sports, they run, they, they walk, they do all these other things. And so how you can best understand what even – the average person is doing on a daily basis and how your training can relate to them is, is really important. Um, well, how many of your gen pop are playing golf, golf, tennis, pickleball, you know, all these most, different, most pickleball, popular all these sport different... in the United States right now. Yeah. Uh, and if you look at those movements, like they require a lot from these people who are sitting on desks most of the week, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, they, they, you got to connect the dots there for them to get them back moving yeah. again. So, I mean, I think it'll be a really valuable presentation. So I'm excited for that. Um, one thing I kind of want to talk about was, you know, your journey into podcasting. Um, what got you into that? Cause you've been at it for a while now. Uh, you had a lot of episodes. You've had a, some amazing guests on there. Like what got you started? Obviously you said you, you had a passion to be a TJ when you were younger. Um, but like, how did you get in that? And then when you've had so many conversations, like this is my 28th episode, right? You've had over 300 episodes. You've had so many conversations with different people, um, all over kind of different fields and, and backgrounds. How has that affected you as a coach? And, and has, that's had to have been extremely valuable uh, for your own education as well. 
Yeah, I got into it. Um, as you mentioned, um, I guess there was, I, I like talking as you yeah. can probably gather from uh, the conversation we've had so far. I like great conversations. It's one of my sort of, um, feeding mechanisms of, of my spirit. <clears throat> and so I knew it was something I needed to do and podcast it, but I was always fearful of the the technological side of what it was and how you, how you distributed it and all this kind of stuff. And that was kind of a, a resistance piece for me. And so I discovered a course online uh, with a company called London Real. And I saw the thing and I'm like, well, here's this opportunity to do it. I'm going to go all in and try it. And I did it and then just never looked back. You know, once I started doing them, I've, I've never missed a week and I kept doing it. And for me, what it does, uh, Kevin, is just, it. you know, it, it serves so many different purposes. One, it introduces me to really good human beings. Um, I get their story, which is never, you know, a straight line. Uh, there's always, you know, all kinds of different things that feed into who they are and how they became who they are. And I love sort of discovering that and discover and discovering that for myself and for the listener, because then it gives the listener perspective sometimes when they're in their own challenging place or their own, um, you know, choice, choice situation where they can recognize that, you know, there's always a, a direction to go and no, no one direction is, you know, the, the necessary evil or not. You, you just need to try and do and, and explore and, and, and experience. And that what's yeah. really life is about is about that growth experience. Right. So I get to do that and then I get to talk and I have to connect and I meet people um, and then I get to serve a community at large with uh, with that information. So it just feeds something, some part of my soul. I love it very much, and uh, and I will do it probably till uh, God takes me away from this this earth, so to speak. And now I'm exploring the other part, which is the spinning the records piece that I'm supposed to start next week. So. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, uh, for those of you listening, leave your mark is awesome. I mean, he great. Obviously, Scott, you can tell, likes to have conversations, but you ask great questions. Uh, you get a lot out of the people, I feel, uh, when they come on there and you get their story, um, as well as the technical pieces from people who might be performance coaches. But it's a, it's a really, really good listen. So I would recommend tuning into that. And it's funny, I had Anthony Renna on here. Um, right as he hit the anniversary from his podcast earlier this year. And another guy <laughs> who's been at it, I said he was he was doing podcasts when you had to download them separately um, onto an iPod. <laughs> like you didn't just have like the podcast app. Um, and he's, and he, so he's been out for a long time. And the same thing I asked him is like, how did you get started at the beginning? And he said, well, I picked up like essentially podcasting for dummies and read it and was just kind of talking into the microphone and posting it on strength coach um, until like <laughs> the kind of podcast, you know, you know, podcast world kind of blew up, obviously, over the last, you know, five years or so, I would say it's gotten mm -hmm. very, very popular. Um, and for you, it just allows you to, you know, I almost selfishly enjoy doing it because, like you said, you get to have great conversations with people and mm -hmm. it takes you in directions that you might not necessarily go into. So for me, it's like every week I'm like, oh, who do I get to talk to this week and what do I get to learn? And then that starts to kind of accelerate my own thinking about the topics, like talking to you about the different sports you've worked with and the video analysis already has my wheels turning about like going back to the gym and thinking about, you know, different things. So it's, you know, they always say, you know, when one teaches to learn, um, mm -hmm. every conversation ends up kind of leading you in another direction intellectually. So, so really mm -hmm. valuable. Yeah, we'll have to have you on Leave Your Mark soon. Yeah, I'll get up there. Maybe I'll come right up to Tremblant and join you. That would be fun. That would be fun. Let's do a live one. Yeah. yeah. That would be cool. Um, so, well, one segment I enough. Yeah. <laughs> One segment <laughs> I like to always kind of do towards the end, um, and I forgot to put this in the notes for you, but I'm sure you got something on hand, is I always tell people like a book recommendation. Brennan and I always pull out a book recommendation at the end because it's probably the most popular question that we receive is like, hey, uh, are there any books that you're reading right now that you currently like or, or books that you've read in the past that you recommend to everybody? So I don't know if you have one at the top of your head that you could give and tell us kind of why you like it and kind of how it was helpful for you. Uh, you know what? I'll, um, I'll defer to n uh, not a self, self help or, um, learning thing and say, I read, um, I did it the audio book, but, uh, reading, um, Matthew McConaughey's book, Green Lights. Yes. It's a, it's a really good book. And especially the audio version of it because Matthew reads it. Mm -hmm. And he's a really interesting dude. Like he's uh, lived an interesting life and has great perspective on his life. And I like life, life perspective 
books and people sort of talking about how they made decisions and where they went. So it was kind of like listening to his, his self-professed podcast to a degree on, on his life journey. So it's a, it's a real valuable one. Yeah. Yeah. That was and one. A, a second one that would be more technical that I think is really cool is Rich Davini, who's an ex Navy SEAL wrote a book called attributes that I mm -hmm. think is a real cool book. So I'll put those, ones. we'll put those in the show notes for people to be able to find and download. I found the McConaughey one was super entertaining. Like again, his delivery in him reading yeah. it. And there's a lot about his life that I, I had no idea about. And um, that was, that was a nice one. Like when I'm in the car and I'm just driving home after work, like it's an easy listen and there's a lot of little gems and, and wisdom in there. So that's one I definitely recommend. My father actually sent that one to me. Uh, my mm -hmm. father's an avid audio book uh listener so he tends to like every week send me another one uh from his commute so that's definitely one i would recommend and i'm gonna pull yeah. one out back here for you guys um that i really uh really enjoy to get on which side of my bookshelf it's on here uh so I was just talking to somebody about this book today, uh, earlier this week. I saw a therapist uh, post that they picked it up and they loved it. And this is one, The Body Keeps the Score uh, by mm. Bessel, uh, Bessel van der Kolk. And so he's a therapist. Um, and the subtitle is Brain, Mind, and Body in the Healing of Trauma. And so if you're a therapist or working with people, especially who have chronic pain, um, what you realize after reading this book, and it's pretty kind of dense, um, both with like psychological um, information as well as kind of science, um, is that when people have chronic pain or trauma, how that affects their whole nervous system and how, you know, if someone is dealing with, for instance, chronic back pain for long periods of time, and it's taking them out of their social life and it's affected their ability to earn a living and all these other things that are weighing on their pain experience, how part of their recovery is their entire nervous system, not just the physical components and the muscles and the surrounding mm -hmm. tissues. And so it kind of gives you a really good perspective on people dealing with trauma, things that are also not pain related in there, but it kind of gives you an entire perspective. Um, so I think sometimes when people first get in dealing with people with pain, and sometimes they think it's as simple as like, hey, we rub this, stretch this and lift. And if it was always that easy, we get everybody out a lot quicker. Um, mm -hmm. and so it gives a really kind of good perspective on the central nervous system and it's, it's impact on people's, you know, pain sensitivity and things of that nature. So mm -hmm. that would be my recommendation for the week. I, after I had a conversation with a therapist about it on like Monday, I went back in and like, I looked at, I'm a big highlighter. I went back in and like went through my little highlighted sections and was like, oh, this is something I should probably talk to some of the coaches about and whatnot. So mm -hmm. the body keeps the score would be my recommendation. Well, on that thematic, actually, um, you know, my wife and I teach a concept called reconditioning. And, and in the last two years, three years, we've brought in, we brought in a specialist in neuroscience to backstop it with applied neurology. And a fundamentally, what I've recognized is for the most part in our, in the training industry, we've trained people from the neck down. We don't really <laughs> pay a lot, a lot of attention to the, to the neurology of the, of the, of the body and the mind. And as I've traveled my my life, I've started to recognize in this life of performance that, you know, people have tried to silo the mental prep model, the strength and conditioning model, the therapy model, and these things are all siloed into professional acumens. But fundamentally, it's all it's all it's a one big tangled mm -hmm. web. And so you need to understand the mental dynamics, the psychological dynamics, the neurological dynamics, because they play a part in the healing process, the uh, pain process, the all of these different elements, uh, how people react and act in, in, in the work that they do, uh, their buy in all these different things. So you can't you can't dissociate them from from your your process right and and so our process now is is really looking at um the neurological system and it's you know it's the over governing animal in the kitchen we need to understand it we under, need to understand threat dynamics and how the body reacts to threat dynamics so i talk a little bit about that i'll, I'll bring a little bit of that into the presentation that i'm doing when i'm down with you guys uh because i think it's it you know it's it's important for people to understand that when you look at movement it's not just about the mechanics it's about a lot a lot more than that right yeah tell us a little bit about you know do you guys do some extensive education and mentoring out there? Tell us a little bit about, you know, your reconditioning education and, and kind of where they can find you and what it is that you guys offer. 
Yeah, you can find us at uh, Reconditioning HQ Headquarters, HQ.com. And uh, we teach sort of a three course program to becoming a reconditioning professional. And effectively, what we're doing is we're taking the worlds of therapy and performance and, and weaving them together, but also layering in applied neurology. So it's like this, the three dots are being sort of brought together in one operating paradigm. And fundamentally, what it does is it takes a lot of these sort of, um, courses that you might take like a DNS or an ART or a, you know, a methodological strategy like kettlebell loading or cleans or, or whatever. And it brings all of this stuff into the table and says, from when you use this, this model of, of, of assessment and approach, you start to recognize which pieces, which tools, which methodologies, which practices make the biggest change at the moment that you need to deliver them. So we're creating a model so that people can make better decisions. They can choose to use things to get the right result at the right time. And so you don't foam roll for the sake of foam rolling. You foam yes. roll to create a change for, and you have to recognize, does it create a change for athlete A and not for athlete B? And so therefore athlete A will do foam rolling and athlete B won't. Um, this stretch, this exercise, these, this technique, et cetera, when do you want to use them as a manual therapist? When do you want to use you know, IMS or dry needling. When don't you? When do you want to use ART? When don't you? When do you want to open up something that's not moving very well? Don't just stretch it because it's tight. Stretch, you know, understand why it's tight. Do you know why it's tight? Because if you don't know why it's tight, just stretching it isn't the, mm -hmm. isn't the solution, you know? So a lot of times in our, in our training methodology, we're always looking at outcomes. Like I'm trying to change this, this thing or make this happen, but we're not understanding why it got there in the first place. So reconditioning is really about First layer, layer is we talk a lot about the assessment process, how we look at movement on a, on a functional sort of paradigm, how we change that. We teach a first layer of applied neurology around proprioception. Second course, we get into a lot of what I'm going to, part of what I'm going to teach in the course that I do, vis video analysis, needs analysis, performance analysis, hybriding that with context-oriented assessment. A simple example would be, <clears throat> you know, if I take an alpine skier, if I assess their hips, internal rotation on right leg and then internal rotation on left, they may look symmetrical. But if I do them together, I do external and internal rotation together and external and internal rotation, all of a sudden they're not symmetrical because they're, 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 there's a, an implied relationship between the two that I'm, I'm, I'm taking a look at. So if for a skier, they might have a better left footer turn than a right footer turn because when they have to make them work together, they don't work together. So we look at context, we look at all that sort of stuff, and then we marry in visual and vestibular systems. And then our last course, we get into the brain, the brain stem and cortex and how the interpretive dynamics of the neurological system manage information. So it's a pretty cool little model that you go through to give you better tools, better choice of tools, uh, better direction, et cetera, and, and bring the two worlds together. That's amazing. I mean, it's really kind of full circle uh, when looking at performance and health and, and rehabilitation. So, you know, if you're out there listening, definitely check out Scott's stuff. He's an unbelievable resource. Uh, King O Payne on Instagram, if you're looking for him, <laughs> uh, you'll be able to see a lot of his stuff there. He always posts podcasts on there and uh, lots of good uh, training tidbits too. Um, definitely look out for him again. He'll be a speaker at our spring seminar, April 1st and 2nd. You can attend live in Woburn, Massachusetts, um, both days. Uh, again, along with Scott, obviously Mike Boyle, Pat Van Galen, Jordan Syatt, as well as myself. Uh, Vinny Toludo, Dan McGinley, and Eric Daddario. So my fellow MBSC coaches will be there over the two days. Uh, we'll have a social. We have uh, group workouts both days. It's always a really fun weekend. And if you can't be there in person, it will be available via live stream. Um, and the recordings will be available to everyone who attends in person or online. And um, we really would love to have as many people there as possible. So please come. I guarantee it will be one of the best educational experiences of the year. Um, and Scott, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to talk to me today. And I will catch up with you sometime in Montreal. I will give you a heads up next time we head up to the in-laws. And I'll make sure to uh, touch base with you up there. Please do, buddy. I appreciate it. I appreciate having the time with you today. Yeah, absolutely. Have a good one, man.